Hello hackers! Welcome to video two of the return oriented programming module of Pwn College. Strangely enough, called Binary Lego. What is Lego? Uh, yes, I am talking about Lego, the plastic blocks with which you build stuff. Because it is a perfect analogy for return oriented programming. When you acquire a Lego set, it comes with a bunch of blocks, an instruction booklet, and by following the instruction booklet's instructions and putting blocks together in a specific way, you create a Lego structure, like a car. Now, what happens if you leave the room and your roommate sibling uh, adversary runs in and scribbles all over your Lego instruction booklet. You come back, you don't notice, and you keep building. If you follow a maliciously crafted Lego instruction booklet with the same Lego pieces, you could build something completely different, something that will blow up your plans um, because it was specifically maliciously crafted to achieve a different goal than the original Lego instructions. This is the analogy of return-oriented programming. In this analogy, the blocks are bytes in the text section of your binary. Executable data. The instruction booklet is the stack with its stored return addresses that can be overwritten by a stack-based overflow. And the um, result of the uh, effort of following the instructions is, are the actions taken by the program. And by overriding the return address, uh, overriding the stack, overriding stored return addresses, the attacker can force the CPU to take those blocks, the raw bytes in the text segment, and build them into something different, something that wasn't intended to be built by the program. All right, let's take a look at a conceptual analogy on source code, and then I'll actually dive in and do this exact attack that I'm talking about on binary level. Um, here's a program uh, that asks for your name, and that's it. It also happens to have code in the binary that will open the flag file, do nothing with it. It also has code in the binary that will open something that is not the flag file, and send you the output, right? None of this quite gets you the flag, but there are problems here. The obvious one is a buffer overflow with which you can overwrite the return address. Um, and you can overwrite not just the return address, but the return address after that return address or the, the data after that return address. Normally that data might contain stacked local variables of libc start main or, or what have you, right? but it doesn't have to. The stack has no memory of what it used to be once you overflow it. Once you overflow it and trigger that first return, your program continues according to your instructions. You have overwritten the Lego manual. The manual no longer remembers how many pieces are involved in one specific step. Where the return addresses used to be is irrelevant. What's relevant is what is on the stack and what that is telling the CPU to do. So let's take a look at, at, at this um, first on the slide and then uh, in an actual example. On the slide, we uh, overwrite you know, the, the name 16 bytes with a, and then we have this return address. Um, and we overwrite it with line six, right? And so when main returns, it will return into this line that opens the flag file and then returns. And when this returns, it will jump into line 10 that will send a file, some file descriptor, into uh, standard out from location 0 to location 1024 in that file. Our standard open send file shellcode. By crafting return addresses carefully, we've managed to essentially execute what is the open send file shellcode 
using return oriented programming. So let's actually do it. Let's take a look. Um, I actually created um, Rob example C. Here it is. Amazing. Um, let's compile it. I already, in fact, wrote the command. Um, two things that you will immediately notice. We have to disable stack canaries so that we can survive the overflow here. And we have to disable um, address space layout randomization just for the uh, binary itself. Um, that's also an important uh, piece for this simple example, right? Um, but in your, in the practice, excuse me, problems for the module, you will have examples where that is not disabled. All right, so we compile this and we run it. And of course it doesn't print anything. It just takes uh, uh, on, on the name. If you give it more than 16 bytes, it'll sec fault. Um, if we GDB and run and then give it more than 16 bytes, it'll sec fault on the ret. And you can see that that is overflowed that makes sense. And then uh, the next eight bytes are also overflowed. I gave it quite a lot, right? All right, let's wrap. So um, first let's uh, disassemble the wrap example. And there's a couple of things that we are interested in. First, here's main, here's the read um we can see that the stack frame is 16 bytes uh in size and then there is uh the saved return uh, sorry the saved rbp the saved base pointer um so uh and then the saved return address so for the overflow we need to send 16 padding bytes whatever a's then uh eight more to that'll get put into rbp and then the next eight is going to be the return address. Cool. And then there are the two things that we were um, interested in uh, in the program. One is in function foo. And in function foo, it will load something into RDI. Of course, we know so that this is slash flag. Then it will, uh, before that, it'll zero out our SI. That's the um, mode to open it with. Zero is read only. That's great. And then it'll call open and then it'll return. Of course, open uh, puts the file descriptor into RAX. So now we have the file descriptor in RAX. We pop something off the stack. So we need to send something to be popped again into RBP and we return. All right. Of course, we want to then return to bar where we have our uh, send file call. And if we go back upwards from the send file call, we can see that send file, um, the first argument is set to one. It's gonna send two standard output. The second argument, we got very lucky, is set to EAX, the lower uh, 32 bits of RAX, which is where foo put the file descriptor. So it's perfect. And then third argument is zero. Fourth argument is uh, hex 400, that is 1024. So basically, if you jump here, we'll set the four arguments to send file and then call it. A plan comes together. So let's um, jump into a screen session because we'll run GB for, from phone tools. Um, so uh, let's create a script. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we launch wrap example, and then, oops, and then we're going to send it a a bunch of data. First, we're going to send our sixteen A's. That's our name. Then we're going to send. So we can say, okay, let's let's add comments here. This is our name that we will fill up. Then we overwrite the uh, saved base pointer of main. Okay, or in main, in mains 
stack frame. All right, then now we are overwriting the saved return address. What do we want to overwrite it with? We want to overwrite it with um, this address right here in bar, right? From main, we want to immediately jump into here. This is uh, loads slash or into here. This says the second argument to zero for open, the first argument to slash flag. Uh, we're assuming that slash flag, but we've seen the source code um, and it is. So we want to jump here, right? So this is nice. So here we will, of course, uh, pack that into eight bytes. Okay. Now what? Now we jump there. Oops. We'll jump there, and that's uh, great. Um, we will start executing. Eventually, we'll pop our BP, right? So we need to put something on the stack as we're writing, right? That will get popped uh, into our BP. So um, say return address. Let's just put in two point two um, foo's open call and setup, of course. Now uh, this is going to get popped by foo into RBP before it returns. So we'll just put some garbage. We don't care what this is. Okay. Now what? Now this, this is where foo will return to. So where do we want to return to from foo? Of course, we want to return to this beautiful piece of code that will set up um, the send file call and call it. We want to return to here. So we want to do turn to the send file call and set up in bar. And we pack it here. And we should be good. And then we pee that read all. Print it. First shot, rock payload gets the flag. Let's see what happens more in depth. Let's um, do this p.gdb.pwn.gdb.attach uh, p. Okay, let's run until main. Okay, here we go. Why is it re already returning from main? Why are we so far into main? Okay, something went weird. Let's uh, let's do this. It all all already succeeded. All right, let's do this again. Okay, here we are in read. Oh, interesting. It did not pwn tools did okay so pwn tools only caught the program at the read that's fine not a problem that actually makes sense because it we attached after the fact um okay so we we did our read we did our overflow um let's step step into the red let's see where we're about to return to uh actually hold on sorry about this let's restart i want to show you that we overflowed Okay, boom, we overflowed. Let's um, see what's on the stack, a bunch of A's. Okay, once we leave, that restores the previous uh, stack frame. Um, the, 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 it moves RBP into RSP to eliminate, to deallocate the existing function stack frame, and then it pops RBP to um, restore the base pointer of the previous function. Of course, we overrode RBP, um, RBP is now B, all Bs. Okay, if we look at what is next, it's that address we wrote. This is the address in foo. If we step, boom, we are in foo, setting up the open call. Let's set up the open call. All right, call open has been called. RAX is now three, third file descriptor. 
And we're about to pop our BP uh, in Foo's function cleanup. That's gonna go become all C's. Uh, our BP doesn't really matter what values are in there. We just need to make sure that we are properly setting up the stack. If we had put our return address right there, it would have been popped into our BP and then the program would have returned to some garbage. So that would have been no good. All right. And um, we're about to return to the next part of our exploits, which is in bar. Boom. Here we are in bar. And this is the setup of send file. And we're now about to call send file. And eventually the program crashes because we didn't bother fixing up the stack afterwards. But we have our beautiful flag. All right. So that's um, return oriented programming. We, you saw we were controlling the program by hijacking its return address in a nutshell. Um, but real exploits are more complicated. Right? First, you overflow the stack. Um, a step zero that we're kind of going to go kind of going to go through return arts programming by induction. You overflow the stack. We did that by controlling that first return address. You trigger what is called a gadget. That part of food that we triggered that opened the flag. That was a gadget. It's a much bigger gadget than you would normally trigger actually, but it was a gadget, right? Um, normally gadgets are super tiny. You'll talk about them in, in a bit, just one instruction and then a return. But when that gadget returns, we also control the return address of that gadget. And that is the inductive step where we retain control. By combining these gadgets, like we did with the two gadgets, we can achieve arbitrary uh, actions um, and, and, and this chain of ROP gadgets, I hid myself to show you that word, is called a ROP chain. Very cool. All right. What's the, the bottom line? The bottom line is that your uh, ROP chain is basically shell code. When you create all of these gadgets and you, uh, I apologize for how this slide looks, but when you create all of these gadgets and um, put them all together, you're essentially creating shell code, but the instructions available to you are really weird. We use two instructions. One of those instructions opened the flag file or meta instructions, right? Uh, two gadgets. One gadget opened the flag file. The other gadget did send file. Um, in, in, in hacker terms, this is called a weird machine. Uh, you are programming using return oriented program by, by writing return addresses, a machine whose instruction set makes no sense. It's made up of meta instructions that are, you know, parts, pieces of, of what the original program actually wanted to do. And we are taking them apart, putting them together into something else, like you might do, again, with a Lego set. Um, there's actually a related um, concept called accidental Turing completeness. If you, if you check out this link um, or Google for the concept, there are tons and tons of... Um, uh, things that, that, that actually turn out to accidentally be Turing complete. A good example is the game Magic the Gathering. You can make computation, you can create a deck that is complex enough to actually carry out algorithms through the rules of Magic the Gathering, the game. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff that are also uh, um, Turing complete um, by accident, uh, which is an interesting concept related to these weird machines, right? Obviously, a deck in, in Magic the Gathering is quite a weird machine, but so is pieces of program taken apart and stuffed back together carefully in a targeted way. Um, the, the, the core takeaway, though, is ROP is fun. You are a sculptor. You're taking a boring program. You saw that program we started with did nothing. And by exploiting a vulnerability to break that program apart and crafting it back together by carefully creating a chain of return addresses on the stack that cause pieces of that original program to perform operations 
that it was not originally designed to do. We are building something new. We're sculptors exposing the art in the program. That's what I would encourage you to think about as you uh, suffer through the rest of the module. This is fun.